Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Rukmini Banerjee, and I am one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for the year. In 1776, Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations and started a revolution of the social sciences. He reconceived the world economy and paved the way for the creation of novel policies and market solutions. To tell us more about the significance of this revolution and its continuing influence, we have with us today Professor Mark Skousen. Professor Skousen is the Dottie Sprogley Endowed Chair of Free Enterprise at Chapman University. He earned his PhD in Monetary Economics at George Washington University. In 2018, he was awarded the Triple Crown in Economics for his work in theory, history, and education. He has taught at Columbia Business School, worked for the CIA, was president of FEE, and was a consultant to IBM. He has written for the Wall Street Journal and is a regular columnist for Forbes magazine. He is the author of over 25 books, including The Making of Modern Economics and The Maxims of Wall Street. He has been the editor-in-chief of the award-winning investment newsletter, Forecast and Strategy, since 1980, and he also produces Freedom Fest, the world's largest gathering of free minds every July in Las Vegas. Professor Skousen's impact is not just academic. His work was so powerful that the federal government began publishing gross output, or GEO, every quarter along with GDP. It is the first major macro statistic of the economy to be published quarterly since GDP was invented in the 1940s. Today, in honor of the 300th anniversary of Adam Smith's birth, Professor Skousen will describe Smith's impact on the global economy and government policy, identifying the ways in which Smith's, la in which Smith's laissez fair model has succeeded and failed in terms of free trade, globalization, and other contemporary issues. He will compare the Adam Smith's invisible hand model with other competing schools of thought, including Keynesian and Marxist interpretations of, econ of the economy. During his talk, Professor Skousen will reference his latest book, The Making of Modern Economics, The Lives and Ideas of the Great Thinkers. This book is for sale along with other materials you can pick up for free in the back over there. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. Please take this time to silence and put away your cell phones. We have an amazing presentation for you today. Be present and get ready to engage in dialogue and ask thoughtful questions. As usual, video and audio recording by the audience is strictly prohibited. Welcome to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, one of my favorite economists, uh, Adam Smith, and to talk about economics. I do have one economics joke that I think is fairly good. I'll try it out on you. Priya, thank you very much for the invitation. And also, I should thank uh, uh, Gary Smith who um, uh, she suggested to Priya that, that I speak. He uh, teaches economics and finance at uh, Pomona College and uh, he's very much of an expert on AI and uh, chat GBT and all of that stuff. He's, he's a pretty interesting guy, so you should definitely follow his work. And uh, Sean, thank you for coming. I, taught a, or gave a lecture this afternoon at Scripps College at Sean Flynn's class in his finance class. And I was glad to see some of the students knew what a top line and bottom line is in, uh, in a financial statement. So it's a good sign. So anyway, there's a story of three economists, uh, and econ I guess there were three people going out and playing golf. Uh, one was a minister, another was a, um, a lawyer and an economist. Uh, and they started off on the, uh, on the first, first hole, and uh, there was a 10-minute wait, not bad, but they teed off. But uh, by the third hole, there was a 20-minute delay, and then by the eighth hole, there was an hour delay. So after the ninth hole, they all rushed into the pro shop, and they said to the pro, what in the heck is going on? He said, oh, gentlemen, have some patience. Don't you realize it's Blind Golfer's Day? And uh, so the minister said, oh, I feel so bad. I'm going to give a talk, uh, a sermon this Sunday on the importance of patience and, and being charitable toward those who, have, uh, have, uh, who are blind. And the lawyer said, oh, I feel so bad that uh, I'm going to donate, uh, I'm going to give a check for $1,000 to the Blind Golfers Association. And over in the corner is the economist stroking his beard. And so the pro and the minister 
and the lawyer look over to the economist. And finally, the economist said, wouldn't it have been better if the blind golfers had played at night? <laughs> and that kind of describes the economist attitude, right? Uh, it's famous for being the dismal science, not so much from Adam Smith's point of view, but from uh, David Ricardo and Malthus and so forth, who were always uh, rather dismal about the outlook for the economy. And uh, the dismal science kind of came out of that. And the, the, the economist is always the one who is kind of the curmudgeon in the group who, when the engineers say, hey, we can go to the moon. And they never ask the question that the economist asks is, well, how much is it going to cost? And is there something else we could do with the money, opportunity cost? So fortunately, economics has changed a lot. Now it's more of an imperial science, and it's invading other uh, disciplines, uh, sociology, religion, finance. Economists are making tremendous contributions in all of these fields. And so I wrote a book called Econopower one time, and uh, one country in particular is really smitten with the idea that economics was an imperial science. And, uh, and they paid me a $100,000 advance for my book, Econopower. You know what country that was? Korea, South Korea. If you know anything about the Koreans, they, and I'm talking South Korea, not North Korea, uh, they are aggressive, and they are the hardest working people in the world, according to the OECD. You know what the second hardest people are, are in the world? Mexicans. Mexicans, according to surveys, the second hardest working people. And having hired many legal and illegal immigrants from Mexico, I can tell you, <coughs> they never quit. So... Uh, a little off sub subject there, but uh, let's talk a little bit about Adam Smith because it's the 300th anniversary <clears throat> of his birth. So on June 5th um, of this month, of next couple of months, I will be in Scotland at the Palmer House, which was the final home where he lived and worked as a customs official. I will be delivering the uh, uh, official Adam Smith lecture, so I'm really looking forward to that. I've really been looking forward to the speaking here at the ATH. Uh, you've had a tremendous group of uh, speakers in the past, so I consider it an honor to, to be here. So the topic is the father of free market capitalism turns 300. How much of Adam Smith's hand is still visible? Because he's famous for his invisible hand. And uh, it is a very interesting symbol. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I brought copies of both the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which he wrote, and The Wealth of Nations. This one, Theory of Moral Sentiments, is not as well known, but certainly an extremely important book. And The Wealth of Nations, also uh, in 1776, the Declaration of Economic Independence. And what's interesting is that the invisible hand term is used only once in each book once in each book. So the big argument is, is the Invisible Hand Doctrine a marginal principle, because it's only mentioned once, or is it a central principle to his philosophy? Well, recently, Dan Klein and some other economists have discovered something, and that is where the location is of the Invisible Hand. right in the middle. And lo and behold, it's used once in the theory of moral sentiments. I think I've, ah, right in the center. So maybe he was playing a clever trick on us. Now, Adam Smith is not known as a clever person, but maybe he did. 
invisible hand is not even in the index in the first 150 years of the publication of the Wealth of Nations. It's not even in the index. Okay, Adam Smith, professor of philosophy at Glasgow University and author of these two books. So Wesley Mitchell, which is, this is a great discovery recently about, are you, you already have a question, Phil? <laughs> Phil, Paul? So he was not a churchgoer, but he was definitely under the influence of Calvinist doctrine at that time. He was very familiar with his Bible. He was, after all, uh, uh, a philosopher, moral philosophy at Glasgow. And you had to, you actually had to go through a series of questions um, to make sure that you were orthodox enough to teach. So D David Hume, his friend, who many believed was a, an atheist, if not a, or a heretic, if not an actual atheist, he was denied Oxford Club and or Oxford uh, University and several other places because of his position. So Adam Smith kind of hid his skepticism, if you will, about religion. But um, there is this argument that, uh, like God, uh, God is an invisible God. Uh, so the uh, the, the faith that you have in capitalism uh, is, uh, is various stages, like your belief in God. Okay, now some people have absolute confidence that God exists. Then there are those who have much faith that God exists. There are some who have little faith that God exists, and then there are some who have no faith in or atheists, right? Same thing applies to capitalism, doesn't it? Some people have tremendous faith that capitalism will survive any financial crisis and persevere. Others have much faith. Some have little faith. And then there are the Marxists who have no faith in capitalism, right? And want to, uh, want to uh, uh, replace it with uh, socialism, totalitarianism, what have you. So uh, there's, a, there's something to be said for that. I'm glad you brought that up. Wesley Mitchell, who was at Columbia University, he has written something that I just recently discovered. He wrote the best essay that I've ever seen on the history on, on Adam Smith. And uh, so he makes the statement Adam Smith did for economics in many ways, like, man, like what Charles Darwin did for biology, a new framework. And then uh, Jerry Mueller, Catholic University, said, uh, the Wealth of Nations is the most important book ever written about capitalism and its moral ramifications. It was intended to make men better, not just better off. So he's making the point that he was a moral philosopher and not just an advocate for materialistic capitalism. Very important. He's been misunderstood a lot. I have a nice bust here from the Adam Smith Institute for if you can see what he looked like. Uh, he never posed, by the way, for a uh, portrait in his entire life. So these busts are all based on, on what they thought he looked like. And so we're all familiar with 1776. I do ask my students at Chapman uh, what year was our country started. And I do get some blank stares. It's not a good sign. Uh, but we're all hopefully familiar with July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Political Independence. Uh, and then, of course, an inquire into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, the Declaration of Economic Independence. Two volumes set. I happen to own a first edition of the Wealth of Nations. And the uh, Edinburgh University at the Palmer House, if you go to the Palmer House in Edinburgh, you will see, um, you will see uh, my, co my two copies. Okay? And I do open it up to the second volume right at the beginning of where it talks about the led by an invisible hand. Okay, so the revolution, what was the revolution? Why was he like Charles Darwin or Thomas Jefferson or Sir Isaac Newton? He's actually very much taken with Sir Isaac Newton and imitated. Okay, what did Sir Isaac Newton do? Well, he created a series of laws that created a uh, self-governing, stable system of the universe, the solar system. 
And so Adam Smith wanted to create something similar in the social sciences in, in the economy. So here's his beginning part. The book is called The Wealth of Nations, Inquiry into the Causes and, and uh, Wealth of Nations. So uh, he's studying how nations become wealthy, and he is not impressed with how the United Kingdom had become wealthy because uh, there was not very much growth. And here's the reason why. He said, based on his heritage, there is a Scotsman inside every man. The Scotsman is a person who is intently pr intent primarily upon pushing his own fortunes and who possesses a high degree. Well, why should I read this? Would you like to read this? Go ahead and read this. It'll give me a little break. So this is basically what Wesley Mitchell is saying. Uh, Adam Smith is saying no to the nanny state. No to your parents telling you everything you need to do. You're on your own. And as a result, you, do, you make better choices. Now, you don't always make better choices. Okay, if you give some, freedom is a dangerous word in this country. It is a dangerous word all around the world. We give people their freedom. Will they do the right thing? I have, I have contradictory books. If you come to my home in North Tustin, I have a series of contradictory books. Asia Rising, Asia Falling. How to Win Friends and Influence People. How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. So I have a Milton Friedman book called Free to Choose positive view about freedom, free to choose. If you choose, you're going to be a better person because of it. Right next to it is by John Romer, professor, a Marxist professor at Yale University, free to lose, free to lose. If you have freedom, you might lose. You might become a drug addict. You might commit a crime. This is the risk you take when you have freedom. Still a major issue. So he's rejecting the nanny state here. He's rejecting top-down business decision-making, top-down government decision-making, telling you what to do during the pandemic. You don't make a decision whether to wear a mask or not. You're told you have to wear a mask. You're told you have to be vaccinated. Freedom is a rare and delicate flower can be destroyed very easily. So according to Wesley Mitchell, okay, we need another reader. Who would like to read? You, sir? Now, he did not ever call his program laissez-faire or free market capitalism or free enterprise. He called it system of natural liberty. Where did he come up with that name, system of natural liberty? It sounds very familiar with what Sir Isaac Newton used for to describe his solar system and his scientific laws of nature. He called it the system of natural liberty. philosophy, system of natural philosophy. And they didn't call it science, physical sciences back then. They called it natural philosophy. And so he was imitating Sir Isaac Newton with his system of natural liberty. Okay, the revolution, Adam Smith thesis. Okay, so Sean, you want to try your hand at this? Read the whole thing. Yeah, the whole thing. 
Yeah, read it fast. Pretty harsh words for government said in 1755, even before the Wealth of Nations. But I want to get back to that first one, manifest violation of the most sacred rights of man. A lot of times Adam Smith's viewed as a utilitarian, a practical economist. But here he's talking about natural rights. Pretty unusual. So for those who criticize Adam Smith for not believing in natural rights, you can just quote him right there from the from from the uh, book, okay. The Invisible Hand Doctrine, uh, we've already talked about that, so I'm going to pass on that, but the Invisible Hand concept, even though he didn't use the name, it's referred to all the time, where private individuals act that benefit everybody in the general, uh, uh, general uh, business, and, and that's what happens under capitalism, okay. I hold this pen up in my hand, and uh, private individuals, for selfish reasons, for profit only, made this pen. But everybody benefits from it. So he did describe situations uh, under crony capitalism where everyone was acting in their own self-interest. And it did not benefit the public. It did not lead promotion of society. And this is why he strongly objected to crony capitalism to merchants and business people who are in cahoots with the government to gain monopoly power, very much opposed to that. Uh, so I've got other, a few quotes here. I do like this statement by uh, Alan Greenspan. Would somebody like to read that in the back? Yeah, read the, uh, the, the second quote. So this is a great statement by Alan Greenspan that basically is saying that this is why Adam Smith's view was so revolutionary, because back then selfishness, self-interest was not viewed as a virtue. You need to think of other people. The Christian view was to, to love your neighbor. They forgot the part, love yourself. The focus is on the good Samaritan, right? the prodigal son, to think of others, not yourself. And in fact, it wasn't until 1741 that a Protestant minister or a Catholic priest actually gave a pro-wealth sermon. You know who it was? John Wesley. John Wesley, who founded what church? Methodists. And the Methodists turned out to be the richest people because they followed his sermon, which was earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Kind of self-serving for John Wesley to do the third part, give all you can. But notice he did not use the Keynesian term, spend all you can. That's not in there. So the Methodists were famous for being very parsimonious and they wouldn't buy a lot of consumer goods and stuff like that but they saved and saved and saved and built up businesses and so on. They turned out to be the wealthiest people among all the Protestant and Catholic groups. So uh, there's a lot to be said for, for that view, but this view of being self-interested or selfish was viewed as a vice and the word vicious actually came from this term as Benjamin Friedman uh, has, has written, uh, he, he's at Harvard. 
Uh, the Adam Smith model, so how did the Adam Smith model work to transform selfish greed into public benefit? See, this is, a, this is his breakthrough work right here. And you see this in the Wealth of Nations. This is probably the most important statement in this entire thousand page book, which is available in paperback. Can you imagine Bantam paperback putting out the Wealth of Nations? So folks, you can take this to the beach, Newport Beach. Can you imagine people taking pictures of you as you're reading the thousand pages of the Wealth of Nations? So this is the most important quote in the entire book. Okay, so who wants to read this one? Don't all jump at once. Okay, please. Okay, so there are three words here that form the foundation of his theory, okay? One is justice, the other is free, freedom, and the last one, very important, this one, competition. Those are the three elements. So the laws of justice, this is really important. So he favors uh, a legal system, protect life, liberty, and property to enforce contracts, payment of debts, and punishment for violations of, ju of justice. Uh, Smith's ideal society is infused with virtue, mutual benefit, and civil laws prohibiting unjust and fraudulent business practices. He also advocated easy taxes. Easy taxes. What does that mean? It means you pay it without complaining. Do we have easy taxes today? No. You know, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. Do we have expensive government today? Is government cheap or is expensive? Whether you're, whether you're, I, I've given speeches across this country to Republicans and Democrats, and I ask the question, is government expensive or not? Everybody raises their hand. You may favor expensive government, but you know it's expensive. We don't, uh, Benjamin Franklin had a great line. He said, a virtuous and industrious people may be cheaply governed. So do we have cheap government? No. So what does that say about us as an industrious and virtuous people? You see, good question. So how do you moderate the passion? See, that's his breakthrough. How does he moderate the passions? Okay. And the answer is commercial, the commercial society, commercial society, okay? So who would like to read this from the Wealth of Nations? Please, in the back there, yeah. This is a great example of where the invisible hand is not working. It becomes the uh, greedy uh, iron fist, if you will. This is what the Marxists complain about. The essential role of competition. This is the key because through competition, commerce in the marketplace encourages people to become educated, industrious, punctual, dependable, self discipline and defer gratification is the fear of losing customers which re restrains his frauds and corrects his negligence fishmongers or butchers who gain a reputation for cheating their customers or even just treating them rudely would see their prospective trade move on to the next stall Sh surly or uncooperative workers would earn no wages i saw this personally when i took my family to the soviet union Took my two oldest children, my wife and I, and we went there. Uh, when we went into the stores, the state schools, the state schools, the clerks never smiled. They never smiled. They never treated you as a customer. You were just getting in their way of, of uh, work. 
And there was no other place to go. You went to the store, the state store, grocery store, and that was it. There was no competition between a Safeway and an Albertsons and, and what have you. Okay, So when you have that kind of competitive spirit, it restrains the passions. It moderates the passions. Doesn't eliminate fraud. In the capitalist model, you're still going to have people committing fraud. But it moderates, it reduces that effort because you can, as a customer, you can always take your business somewhere else. And that forces, that forces the business person, the salesperson to be, to take a Christian attitude toward you as a consumer, to treat you as a, a, a person who needs to be uh, placated. Capitalism civilizes greed in much the same way that marriage civilizes lust. Greed, like lust, is part of the human nature. It would be futile to try to root it out. What capitalism does is to channel greed in such a way as it works to meet the wants and needs of society. So for those who say capitalism encourages greed, does not have real world experience. Because I can tell you, being in the financial market, you know what happens to greedy people? Greedy people either lose a lot of money or they go to jail. Smith's Invisible Hand of Prosperity, interesting, came out right then, 1776, right during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The James Watt of uh, the steam engine and so forth all the different inventions all coming out right after that. And in many ways, the world listened to Adam Smith. He had tremendous influence, especially on free trade. And um, government saying, hey, maybe we should reduce, deregulate is the word, deregulate. Triumph of the optimist. So I'm in the optimist camp of Adam Smith and the U.S. This is the stock market of 34 stock markets from 1900 to 2000, showing the tremendous growth. And the red is, by, by the way, a, a U.S. stock market outperformed American exceptionalism here. Uh, so the three propositions, the Adam Smith model is, one, it will lead to higher economic growth and higher standard of living because you're unleashing individual initiative. You're letting them do what they do on their own. It will benefit both rich and poor, universal opulence. So the example of the United States being um, a uh, uh, place where any, the American dream can be, this whole idea of the American dream is very much part of the Adam Smith model. There's a new book out called uh, Adam Smith's America and it talks about the influence that, um, that Adam Smith's model had in the United States. Never forget uh, uh, George Foreman. Uh, he spoke at our Freedom Fest conference. You know, the heavyweight champion of the world twice. And an entrepreneur. So he was our keynote speaker one year as a motivational speaker. And he came up to me and he said, Mark, now listen, you need to understand, I, don't, I give a motivational speech. I don't give a political speech. And I don't want any political questions. Please, no political questions. And I said, OK, fine. But you are going to be asked Q&A after your speech. So. He gets up there and gives this great speech, standing ovation, talks about how successful he's been uh, in, in, as a heavyweight champion in the world and uh, how he's been an entrepreneur uh, all his life and he's been a preacher and so forth. And then the questions started coming. And the questions were all about, well, what is it like to be knocked out by Muhammad Ali? And what was it like to start uh, an entrepreneurial business uh, with the grill and so forth. And what was it like to be a preacher uh, to motivate people and stuff like that? That was all great. And then the last question, a woman gets up and says, Mr. Foreman, what's your opinion of Black Lives Matter? And he paused for a minute and he said, you know what? I grew up dirt poor in Houston, Texas and became the heavyweight champion of the world. Does that answer your question? That was, that was a moment at that conference. That was, that was really impressive. 
You could handle a political question. All right, uh, so capitalism gives opportunity for people, both rich and poor. And he promised universal opulence, which extends itself to the lowest ranks of the people. As Andrew Carnegie said, capitalism is about turning luxuries into necessities. In his final argument, it will be a stable economic system. He actually believed if you had a system of natural liberty, if you did it right, put in the right combination, you could have a stable system and you wouldn't have the boom-bust cycle that, that capitalism is famous for. And so even though he didn't invent supply and demand curves, that didn't happen until uh, Alfred Marshall came 100 years later. But you can see he did develop this uh, quote uh, on the quantity and so forth. Who would like to read this? Anybody falling asleep would like to read? Yeah, OK. So do you see a little bit of uh, Sir Isaac Newton there gravitating toward the central point, the stabilizing, self-stabilizing system? See how he's trying to imitate Sir Isaac Newton? It's pretty cool. Use the same kind of phraseology. And you can get that, as I show, and all of us who teach economics, this is fundamental, right? If, if students learn anything, it's supply and demand. What's the solution to X problem? Supply and demand. Okay, so classical model of economics is pro-savings, capital formation, technology, entrepreneurship, the supply side. Number two, limited government, uh, live within your means, fiscal policy, balanced budget, low taxes, monetary policy, sound money, gold standard, and free trade. And we already quoted this, little else is required, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, and we need to add sound money in there, no inflation. So that's his model. So the question is, how much of the invisible hand, this is the last part of my lecture, how much of the invisible hand is still around? Okay. Well, you can see the number one big winner is free trade. I mean, basically, we're down to almost nothing. We, we have open, open borders in terms of goods and services. And up until 100 years ago, open borders in terms of capital and human beings going from one place to another. After all, why should someone be penalized for being born in the wrong country? Think about that. So the Adam Smith model, this was the number one success, was free trade. But growth of government, different story. It, we talk about the law of diminishing returns. When are we going to see that with government? It just grows and grows and grows. And it's usually some kind of crisis that causes government to grow. So we, we've reached almost 50% here in the U.S. It's probably come down a little bit recently. But government spending as a percent of GDP, half the econ economy. We're, we're half slave and half free. Might be. So I would kind of think that we're kind of topping out on that. I would like to think so. Sweden, Sweden is a great example. They topped out in the, they had a monetary crisis in the uh, early 90s, and they made changes. They slashed taxes. They slashed government spending. They privatized, partially privatized their social security system. They adopted school choice. They, had, they expanded free trade. They did a lot of things, and Sweden has been much more prosperous uh, ever since then. Sweden's a great model to, to look at. Ba balanced budgets, so that's a tradition. We've lost that because of Keynesian economics. Uh, we've justified uh, a, uh, a deficit, permanent deficit spending, and the federal debt taking off. And at some point, it's going to reach a crisis. I don't know when, but nobody seems to care. But interest rates are creeping up. And if those interest rates stay up, we're going to face a monetary crisis. 
my headline from my newsletter, which I have on the back if anybody wants a copy, is the growing monetary crisis. And a lot of it's related to, we just not, we're at sea without rudder. We really are. I mean, what's the, even Keynesian economics teaches you a balanced budget when you have full employment. Do we have full employment today? We have a labor shortage. You guys are all lucky when you get out of school, you're gonna get two or three offers if you have a decent major. That could be an issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do have this, I have this talk where I talk to my students about the five areas. I was talking to you about the five areas and uh, all of them very positive and stuff, but they weren't philosophy, sorry. But it, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't English lit, sorry. And it wasn't law, sorry. Uh, but it was engineering and it was business and it is medical, anything with medicine and sadly HR. HR is growing like wildfire. Okay, so sound money? Well, we did until world, after World War II. So I asked my students, I say, so what, what happened here? Before you'd have inflation with war, 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 and then the wars would end and, and you'd have deflation. But then after World War II, it never went back down. It kept going up. Now this is by two Harvard eco uh, economists and they blame it on the lack of discipline because we went off the gold standard. Those are Harvard economists, pretty surprising. Economic Freedom Index shows that this is Adam Smith's model indexed, the Economic Freedom Index. You have the five criteria which all fit into the classical Adam Smith model. And so he does show that countries that have very little freedom have low GDP, and then those that are mostly free have the highest. Singapore is number one. Average economic freedom rating was moving up, 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 up. We were doing really well, up, free, free, free. But since the pandemic and so on, we've lost a lot of economic freedom. Declining economic freedom index in the US, so this is kind of bad news, is steadily declining, occasionally going up, and then going back down. We're now in the mostly free instead of free category. It used to be free back in 2008. So interesting trend that looks rather negative. I love these stories because there are exceptions to the decline in economic freedom. And Hong Kong is this one, is this is the red one. So there it is, 1960, way down compared to all the other countries. And then gradually, boom, boom, boom. It's like long-term race, you know, marathon race. This guy's coming from behind, coming from behind, coming from behind, and leads, lo and behold, 2010. And then of course, the communist Chinese come in in the last couple of years and are destroying the Hong Kong model. Uh, we always thought China would become Hong Kong, and now it looks like Hong Kong is becoming communist Chinese. It's really a sad commentary. Um, Ireland. So Ireland, look at Ireland. Way down here, the regular pack, staying with the pack. But boom, boom. Why? 12% corporate tax rate and inviting all these foreign companies like Apple to be registered in Ireland. Pretty smart move on Ireland's part. Our loss. And not all is lost in Africa. Botswana, look at Botswana. Nowhere down here with all the others, all the others. Then boom, Botswana, quite a story there because they stabilized their economy, they stabilized their government. They didn't have a dictator running everything. It was democratic capitalism at work here, and it really has been a big success. These last three uh, uh, graphs I got from Finn Kineland, who's the Nobel Prize winning economist at UC Santa Barbara, great guy, really big fan of him. How are we doing on time? I'm kind of ready for Q&A.
Okay, I just want to see if there's anything more. Okay, Chile, this is, this is really a fascinating story of Chile. <laughs> Paul, I think you'll get a kick out of this. So here's all the Latin American countries, and they're all growing. They're all doing okay. But look at the outlier. You know who this is? Chile, the Chile model. The Chicago boys taking over Chile, growing so much faster is they stabilized their economy, they stabilized inflation, they cut taxes, they did, they privatized their social security system, they did a lot what Sweden did, and they are way ahead of all the other Latin American countries. And then we have the richest country in Latin America here, 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 boom, Venezuela. This is the great tragedy. I used to call, I used to email Tucker Carlson. I said, Tucker, you constantly talk about politics and stuff. Why don't you talk about the biggest disaster in Latin America, Venezuela? Why don't you talk about that? Don't you think the American people ought to know about that? A lot of people think maybe we're headed for Venezuela, inflation and all this kind of stuff. Why don't you talk about that? I'd send him email after email. Finally, he wrote me back and he says, Mark, who's paying you to tell me this? That was the end of my friendship with Tucker Carlson. He cut me off. <laughs> and of course, nobody was paying me. The, you know, the thing is, they all have an agenda. Doesn't matter if it's CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. They all got an agenda, and it's, it's let's tell the American people bad news. If you notice, if you took, if you students would like to do a little exercise, just watch a couple of hours of TV on all of these stations. And I guarantee it's all bad news. It's all bad news. And yet, there's a lot of good things that are happening around the world. I wish we could talk about it more. Okay, so I'll end with uh, Adam Smith's optimism. So there was a story in, in the Battle of uh, Saratoga where the Americans finally won a battle at Saratoga. And so uh, this, this uh, one of Adam Smith's students came running up to him saying, we're ruined, we're ruined, the country is ruined. Adam Smith, ah, oh, there's much ruin in the country, meaning it takes a lot to topple the British Empire. It's not gonna be just one stupid loss in Sarato Sarasota, Saratoga, sorry, Saratoga, not Sarasota. I have a home in Florida. Okay, so Sean, why don't you read this last great quote? So is he an optimist or what? I don't know what Venezuelans think of this quote, but uh, anyway, that's a, great, that's a great story. So just to end, I wanna talk a little bit about what I've done. I've done a little bit of a unique thing in my history of thought book the, that I, I brought copies of called The Making of Modern Economics. And uh, it, 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 it's in its fourth edition, published by Rutledge. And here's what I've done that's unique. So if you look at any histories of thought, it's all the same. This economist said this, this economist said that, this economist said this, this economist. There's no running plot. There's no theme. It's just what economists say. So I decided with Adam Smith as the hero, as the protagonist who has developed this system of natural liberty, now I have a hero and I have a storyline. The storyline is the system of natural liberty and how Adam Smith is, uh, is attacked and left for dead, but resuscitated by his supporters, by the French laissez-faire school, by the Austrians, by the Chicago school. And he's attacked and left for dead by the Marxists and by the Keynesians and by the institutionalists like Veblen. And some of them want to build and improve upon the model of Adam Smith, and others want to tear it down and rebuild new. So I've created a storyline, a plot. It's engaging. I tell lots of stories about the personal lives of the economists. And then it has a good ending. The good ending is the collapse of the Berlin Wall 
the collapse of the Soviet central model system, socialism, top down, and now other countries around the world are adopting, uh, uh, they're opening up their economies, they're deregulating, they're privatizing. Privatization is no big thing in the United States, but let me tell you, outside the United States, they've been privatizing stuff like you wouldn't believe, airlines, hotels, oil companies, utilities, it is a monstrous business outside the United States. In the U.S., we never really went through a heavy socialist period, and most everything is uh, run by private companies. But outside the U.S., privatization is really huge. So that's how I develop my model in this book. So every economist is judged or ranked, uh, proven or added to the house of Adam Smith built, or undermined, thwarted, or tried to tear down Smith and replace it with something else. And so I give the due to the enemies of Adam Smith. I have a whole chapter on Marx. It's called Marx Madness. <laughs> Marx, not March Madness, Marx, you get it? Yeah. It doesn't translate well, though. It doesn't translate well. So I asked the Chinese, my book's been tr translated into Chinese and had to go through the censors, right? So you know Ma Marx Madness plunges economics into a new dark age. You kind of know where I stand on Marx. Okay, so it had to be translated and accepted by the, uh, by the censors. So I got my Chinese translated copy and I asked a Chinese expert who, who spoke English and I said, can you give me the title of my chapter on Marx? Is it say Marx Madness and so on? He says, oh no. I said, is it favorable? Oh yes, very favorable. It's called Marx and classical economics is what they titled it. But then I said, okay, read what's inside the actual chapter. And they didn't change any of that. So I had all the criticism of Marx, but I will give them their due. Marx does have some good economics that's really quite beneficial. And I point that out in the, in the end of the book. Same thing with Keynes. Keynes saved capitalism, not from not from the capitalists, but from the socialists. Because let me tell you, in the, in the 1930s, everybody was a socialist. And Keynes came along and said, you know, I don't think we want to adopt the Nazi model. I don't think we want to adopt the Soviet model. I've been to the Soviet Union. It's not pretty. So he said, let's do an alternative called Keynesian economics. So I give credit to Keynes for protecting us from a worse fate. Now we're suffering under Keynesianism today. They're not following Keynesian uh, policy because we should be running a, a surplus right now instead of a, a deficit. But we've opened the barn room door, back door to deficit spending and big spending. And there's no discipline. There's no discipline. If you look at the Biden, I mean, they're just spending money like water. And do you tell me inflation is ending? Think again. Inflation is here as long as we don't have discipline in fiscal and monetary policy. Now, the feds are doing a pretty good job of tightening, but it's causing a banking crisis. And when you have a banking crisis, you bail out the banks. And that's inflationary. You're printing money. The quantitative easing is now skyrocketing again. Uh, discount money borrowed from the discount uh, window of the Fed is now higher than it was in 2008, 2009. So Jay Powell is doing his thing with Fed speak and making it very calm. Everything's fine. Don't worry. Stay, stay invested. Don't panic. Let me tell you, they're panicking right now. You can see it in the statistics. Uh, so we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, we've gone many years with no where the whole system has a collapse. You know, the gold bugs are always predicting end of the world scenarios. And I've never been in that camp uh, for that. But it, you kind of wonder at some point, when is it all going to come, come apart? And that's, that's a good question. So buy your Bitcoin. OK, or gold. OK, so there's some nice quotes from uh, just to entice you to take a look at a book that you may not want to spend $30 for, but let me tell you, Rutledge charges $55. So $30 is, is half off. You get half off today. So I have copies in the back. So I have some great quotes from uh, 
from people of all disciplines. And I really try to stay with the middle of the road Adam Smith model. Not too much government, but it's not an anarchy model either. It's, it's, it's meant to be in the middle. That's the way I look at it in the highest economic growth. So uh, if you want to keep in touch with me, these are my websites, my uh, M. Scows and at Chapman. Love to hear from anybody. So with that, thank you all very much, and I'll answer any of your questions. Come on up to the microphone, huh? And you're going to ask the first question. You know what? I may just have to. Um, but uh, just to transition us into Q&A, um, so please come up to either one of the mics to ask your question. And when you do, make sure to introduce yourself, say your name, um, as well as your major and what year you're in. And then tell us what life is. And you, know, you can also do that, too. <laughs> we had a little discussion around, and I said, fill in the blank, life is. And we got some really good responses. I thought it was a really fun discussion. Hi, thank you for your talk. My name is Simran and I'm a junior studying economics and data science. And um, I'll do my life is first. So life is a series of choices. And then I had another little comment that I thought you'd enjoy, which is that CNN stands for constant negative news. And then um, uh, my question is pretty simple actually. It's just, um, can you elaborate on what economic freedom is? Because you showed a couple of graphs of it, but I didn't catch the definition if there was one. So I just wanted to know more about what exactly that is. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, but it's not just CNN, by the way. All the major news Yeah, I couldn't think of acronyms outlets. for Fox and MSNBC because their names are so yeah. like weird. Like X is hard to come up with it. So I'll keep working, and then I'll try to email you my yeah. ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the phrase. And, and I have really tried to get people... I said, can we just have a whole day of good news? Let's just have a whole day of good news. We need a good news day. That's the way to do it. There's a, there's a day for everything, right? So let's have a good news day. I think it would be kind of fun. That's just my suggestion. So I, I had the list of the five criteria. So what I, I can give you a little background on the Economic Freedom Index. So. Um, a group of, of Canadian economists with the Fraser Institute, uh, Michael Walker in particular, from Vancouver, he contacted Milton Friedman and he said, you know, you can talk to your blue in the face about how great freedom is, but can you put numbers to it? Can you put numbers on it? So they all gathered together in the 80s and they had this big group of, of statisticians and, and math whizzes and stuff and said, okay, let's create an actual index where we measure freedom in terms of business regulation, corruption index, independent, um, uh, independent judiciary, uh, tax rates, trade, how much is global, free trade, um, uh, budget deficits, size of government as percent of GDP, and, and we'll, we'll have each one of them uh, about the same value for these five criteria and we'll create this index, which is what they've done. So if you go to freetheworld.com that has one, the Heritage Foundation has one as well. They, they have these indexes and they go into quite a bit of detail on these. It's fairly complex as to what constitutes economic freedom because there's various aspects of it. Um, and it's it's been very, uh, it's, there's lots of academic papers written on it every year. Uh, their, their biggest problem is there, there may be a uh, confirmation bias because they're all free market people. So naturally, the data that's coming out is very pro-free market. That's been the biggest criticism of this. Uh, how can you be objective when you're writing about stuff that you really believe in? Uh, confirmation bias is, is everywhere. Uh, it's really hard for people to, to put away their biases and just look at the data. Just look at the data and see what, what, comes, uh, what comes out from that. Thank you. And then while you were explaining that, I thought of acronyms for both Fox and MSNBC. <laughs> so I'll just go ahead and share them. So for MSNBC, it's main, shoddy, naughty, and then the B word rhymes with itching, and then club. 
And then for Fox, it's Fatal Oration Explained, but it's just with the X because I couldn't think of a real word that starts with X. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we all become a little too cynical about to, it's it's so sad that I mean, for it just just as a classic example of this Donald Trump fiasco. So Fox News is constantly defending Donald Trump and CNN and MSNBC are constantly criticizing him. And I've noticed that they don't interview the same people. They're interviewing different people who support their views. And the most common response is, well, you're right, Tucker. And then they follow up with the, uh, you know, one thing we do at my Freedom Fest conference, which I do in Las Vegas every year, and, and we're doing it in Memphis this next year, uh, we do lots of debates, and we have a, um, uh, and, and they're civil debates, and they're formal debates, so you can't talk over each other. Everybody gets their point of view presented, and we have over a dozen debates, and we also do a mock trial. So we have a judge, we have a prosecuting attorney, we have a defending attorney, and we have star witnesses, and we have 12 jurors from the audience who uh, give their views. So we've had capitalism on trial. We've had socialism on trial. We've had the Republican Party on trial, the uh, unions on trial. It's really been pretty fun. We're thinking of putting Donald Trump on trial, but that's already happening. So, <laughs> OK, next question. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'm Sophia Rojas, I'm a senior here, um, and I am majoring in biology and econ, it's kind of a, a mashup of that, so my question kind of plays off of that. Um, earlier today I read a research paper about um, how education and housing have fed into this um, overwhelming sentiment of social eugenics and how um, access to um, higher classes is becoming more and more exclusive, especially through education. So I'm wondering um, how you bridge that gap with Adam Smith, as it's not as easy to just step into um, to wealth as it used to be. Thank you. Uh, Adam Smith did advocate public education because he thought that under capitalism, under the industrial capitalism model, you're specializing more and more so you're doing the same thing over and over again. And after a while, it just grates against you to develop any kind of personal behavior. You're spending 10 hours a day at the loom. You ever seen these pictures of 10-year-olds uh, uh, working at a loom for hours and hours? So that's what Adam Smith was talking about. And he said, we, we need to educate everyone so that we can broaden our, our views and so forth. The problem is there's, there's, two, there's two markets that have become more and more costly because capitalism is all about cheaper and better. Uh, long term, uh, in real terms, almost all products are cheaper and better because you're earning more wages and you can pay for these things more and so on. There's, there's a, a lot of studies. There's a new book out called Super Abundance that makes this point by uh, Marion Tupi and Gail um, Hooley, and you should take a look at that. It's talking, talking about uh, time prices, and it's, it's very optimistic about what we can do, but there's two markets that have become more and more expensive over time, and that's medicine and schooling, education, and guess what? Both of those are government-run or more government-regulated and dominated. You don't have a McDonald's model. The McDonald's model is the model that it's cheaper and better. And uh, believe it or not, McDonald's food has improved. Not a lot, but it has improved. Um, okay. could, I, could I push back? And in real terms, bit. it's gone down. Okay, so cheaper and better model is what capitalism is constantly moving in that direction. Could I push back a little bit, though? Yes, um, please. I work with biotech stocks. Um, and I just got back from a conference in which they were outlining pipelines and choosing which drugs to move forward based on um, not general need, but what would have, what's one, the cheapest, and two, um, has addictability. Wow, um, addictability? Yeah. So and, and high profit margins, too, exactly. right? Um, yeah. so <laughs> but but I, why is that? Why is that? I mean, Why is that contrary to the rest of the model that I've been talking about? 
It's not, I mean, it is in the sense that it feeds into this greed principle that Adam Smith didn't account for. Uh, I think it de he does account for it. It's called crony capitalism. And the FDA, Federal Drug Administration, is in large measure playing a major role. I'm not saying every uh, major role. There, there's still culpability among a lot of these capitalists that, uh, I mean, big pharma does have some monopoly power. There's no question about that. And uh, Adam Smith was adamant you have to have a competitive system. Uh, and he was very critical of uh, capitalists who work with uh, government. And of course, they love the FDA because it keeps out competitors. And, uh, but you know, when you have to spend eight years, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, you're familiar with the four phases. Now they can. They can speed up the process, which they did on vaccines uh, in a national emergency, but normally it's the FDA that slows down. And yes, they, they protect you from bad drugs, right? They protect you from bad drugs, but they also keep out a lot of good drugs and they take years. So they actually kill more people than they save. The uh, companies themselves get to choose what's in their pipelines, though. So if they are selecting rare diseases to form a monopoly in those spaces, then that's still that greed principle, and that's not the government's fault. Uh, and look, at, don't get me wrong. Capitalists aren't perfect. They don't do everything right. They make a lot of mistakes. Uh, banks, I mean, Silicon Valley Bank didn't have to do what it did. Uh, so there is. Uh, Remember, Adam Smith said it moderates the passions. It doesn't eliminate the frauds and business deceptive practices. Uh, I'll give you another example, Walmart versus Costco. Walmart pays very low wages, relatively speaking. Costco pays higher wages. Uh, Walmart pays a higher dividend. It engages in a lot of uh, bay, uh, bu uh, stock buybacks. Costco, Costco uh, pays their workers a lot more and provides much more benefits. So there are different business models. Some are better than others. And this is where the, uh, your MBA programs uh, need to teach business executives uh, better ways to manage and, and be uh, uh, better. So we, uh, b business people make mistakes. No question about that. And they need to be criticized. One thing I love about Forbes magazine is it used to be, not anymore, but Forbes magazine was famous for going after these very kinds of issues and going after business people that were engaged in business deception and frauds. They don't do it anymore because their model has been destroyed by the Internet. It's now Forbes.com and Forbes magazine is a ghost of what it used to be. And, and I'm very good friends with Steve Forbes. So I know what he's what he's going through, but we're on the same page here. This is this is a problem. It really is a problem, and I'm not here to just defend capitalism in all its areas because it's free markets. You're free to choose and you're free to lose. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much for the speech. Um, I have a question. So while Adam Smith was making his arguments, he was emphasizing the law of justice, right? And we need the government and kind of the judiciary system. Independent and the, judiciary. Yep. Yeah, and the rules in order to like have the... Um, Bankruptcy laws, Yeah, all of that. everything. But then we have these giant corporations who are funding um, the campaigns of these politicians who in return have kind of a say in the independent judiciary system. And then these are all like tied together. And then you have the powerful businessmen having a kind of say in like who is making the law basically. And when you have the system in place, you don't really have the... Um, rule of law actually preventing the business from going as greedy as they should uh, they as going greedy beyond the limit I'm going to give an example for example we all know about Amazon and how they're preventing like uh, the union formations and how they're treating their uh, workers in a terrible way but they're still in uh, there's they didn't pay any federal taxes I think last year that's what I heard and then they are also still in business and there's nothing like happening against them so how would you say um, the rule of like, would you think that the rule of law is still in place? And if not, what would you recommend us to do in order to 
make sure that just justice is kind of keeping capitalism in check. Yeah, very, very good. You, you raised some really deep concerns about what's happening in the world. And it is true that the business, business is much more powerful than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. No question about that. Uh, it used to be that the church and the state and the army were the big factors. But, but with, with uh, advances in capitalism, it's the bankers, it's the big name capitalists, and Forbes 400 richest list, and so forth. And so you see a lot of crony capitalism, uh, it, which is what Adam Smith was fighting against. He called it mercantilism, but what he was talking about was uh, the business being in bed with the, uh, with the state. And it's really hard to control that. Uh, in some countries, it's much worse than others. Are you familiar with the corruption index that uh, The Economist puts out? Mm -hmm. uh, and the U.S. is, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not as corrupt as a lot of countries in the Middle East and Africa and, and, and some other places. Right. But, uh, but they're not perfect. They're not at, right at the top there either, uh, like, like it is in some European countries that do a, a much better job. Um, you know, Amazon, I don't like their model. Their model is consumer only. And so they did break down and pay their workers $15 minimum. They made a big deal about that a couple of years ago. But guess what? In the fine print, you know what they took away? Stock options. And stock options is what made ordinary people millionaires. Secretaries at Microsoft became millionaires, and they will, they will defend Microsoft to the death because of the good things that they did in that respect. But you have other business, you have a variety of models out there. And uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat critical of the Amazon model and the Walmart model. Mm -hmm. And I'm having uh, uh, Mark Wartzman I mean, uh, no, it's, not, it's uh, Rick Wartzman. I don't know how many of you know Rick Wartzman, but he was the director of the uh, Drucker Institute here at Claremont for many years. So he's written, he's just written a book uh, called uh, Still Broke about Walmart uh, in, in that particular case. Um, you, you have a, I'll give you another example, and that is with uh, agricultural subsidies. You know where that money goes? It goes to uh, big farm uh, corporations. It doesn't go to the small farmers hardly at all. All the huge subsidies, billions of dollars that go to, in agriculture, in a particular, and, and especially the, um, the ethanol scandal. Mm -hmm. Ethanol is a disaster. You talking about an environmental disaster? Ethanol by by producing all this corn, uh, ethanol from corn, is uh, artificially keeping prices high, and th there's all kinds of distortions as a result of that. So I'm not here to defend this sort of thing. We need to minimize and reduce this. Uh, and I don't know exactly how to do that. I'm not in government to, to do that. But again, you're, you're raising some, some real issues that somehow need to be resolved. Uh, I'm a big fan of John Mackey and Whole Foods Markets, which was bought out by Amazon, unfortunately. And their models are clashing in many ways. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where where we can all learn from each other. So the more we talk about this, uh, and see, this is the thing. See, what you're asking is something where you should go to the Amazon annual meeting, and you get up, and the microphone is yours. And you can talk about these things. And we need more of that. We need where we're confronting people about what policies they're adopting. That's what America is all about. But when you're hiding behind and there's no transparency, it can be a problem. Can I say something?
but I, I think I think it's been vocalized enough. There's so many articles written about this. Amazon workers like are unionizing. There's so many conversations in social media. But if you're Jeff Bezos and like you have all that money and you're running Amazon, you're not gonna care about what an ordinary student like me is how to say about what you're doing with your company. I think we need people who are holding significant power either in the government or in the corporate world to step up and push back against but they're not doing that because they also have so many problems going on with their business world. it's kind of like they're all hiding their own stuff and no one can speak up against each other that's what it feels like today and honestly i don't know how to solve that either that's why i wanted to pose this question but it's that's why i'm kind of not that much of a believer of capitalism surviving either yeah well let me tell you i would say on net basis capitalism is a lot better than socialism and i know that socialism is gaining interest in uh, by young people through bernie sanders and so forth but i can tell you that you go to any of these countries that have tried socialism and it is a disaster so uh I mean, I've been to 77 countries. I've seen a lot of these things. And by the way, don't think that unions are lily white in this issue. I've had to deal with unions all my life as running Freedom Fest, for example, hotel unions as an example. And let me tell you, they have their own agenda as well to, um, and I don't know if, if you, sp I spent two hours listening to Howard Schultz and his um, uh, Bernie Sanders committee uh, you should spend some time there. You get you hear both sides, which is great. You hear both sides from the issues. And uh, boy, Howard Schultz told some stories about uh, the dishonest behavior by some union leaders that created a lot of problems uh, and deceptive business practices of going in and pretending to be someone that you're not. Uh, so you have to be careful about this. I, I just give you a, a simple example in my own case with unions because unions tend to really stifle what you can do and what you can't do when you're a union worker. Uh, so you come in and you're setting up a conference. I'm spending a million dollars, a couple million dollars of my money running a conference and they're all union workers and I ask them to move a box from here over to there fairly heavy box that I don't want to lift, $50. Now you tell me if that's a good thing. So I sat there, 75 years old, I picked it up and took it over there myself. This is the kind of stuff that we don't need in this country, is that kind of behavior where you can't do something because that's against the union rules. It just, uh, I mean, the hotel made money, the unions made money, but did we make money? Yeah, you gotta have, it, it needs to be a win-win for everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Skousen yeah, for thank such you. an engaging talk. And thank you all for asking such wonderful questions and participating along. We hope to see you all at the Athenaeum soon again. Have a great night, everyone.